Okay, so um, today we are really diving into uh, a deep dive here yeah. into the world of Pastor Steven Anderson. You know, he's he's made headlines. He's he's known for a guess you would say fiery sermons and beliefs that um, a lot of people might consider pretty extreme. And what's so interesting about uh, what we're going to talk about today is we've got a, you know, a whole stack of sources here, but it's not just about what he says publicly. We've got some stuff that hints at uh, like a darker side. Sometimes the vessel falters, crumbling in his hands. But the potter never gives up. He has a perfect plan. He reshapes the broken pieces with patience and with skill. And what was once discarded now reflects his perfect will on the potter's wheel. We're talking like theological debates, like full on um, accusations of hate speech. And even this is heavy stuff, allegations of abuse. Yeah. You know what I find fascinating is that um, you get these sources, right? And it's like getting a peek behind the curtain. It's it's yeah. like, how do these beliefs, these really rigid, strict beliefs, how do they actually play out in the real world? And, and not just in like a public way, but also, like you said, in a very, very personal way, in a family context. What are the consequences of that? Totally. It's like we're, we're putting together a puzzle, but some of these pieces, they just don't quite fit, you know? Yeah. There's something off. So before we, like, go down all these rabbit holes, let's just, like, take a step back. Who is Steven Anderson? Who are we even talking about here? So Steven Anderson is, uh, he's an American pastor, yeah. right? And he's he founded this church in Arizona called Faithful Word Baptist Church. Okay. And, and he's considered one of the leaders, if not the leader of this this movement, this new IFB movement. New IFB. Okay. Yeah, it stands for New Independent Fundamentalist huh. Baptist. And and this movement is, you know, they're known for taking the Bible very, very literally, very strictly. Mm. And they really, they, they tend to isolate themselves. They, they, they separate themselves from like mainstream Christianity. So when we say taking it literally, like how does that actually manifest? You know, yeah. what are some of the things that he's like, best known for so anderson has he's gained a lot of notoriety right for making these really controversial statements yeah. i mean we're talking he's publicly advocated for the death penalty for homosexuals yeah he's uh he's prayed for the deaths of people like barack obama caitlin jenner he's even um delved into holocaust denial wow okay so we're not talking like your average sunday service here no not at all so like what's the what even is the thought process behind some of these, you know, statements? Like, where is he even coming from? Well, a lot of it stems from this this really literal interpretation of the Bible, right? Yeah. He believes that the Bible is the inherent word of God. There's no errors. Okay. And so he sees it as his duty to preach that and uphold it no matter what, mm -hmm. even if it leads to these these extreme positions. Even if it makes people uncomfortable or or worse. Even then. And this has gotten him into some hot water, you know? I bet. Yeah, he's been banned from, like, over 30 countries. Wow. Yeah, I mean, most of the developed world, he's not allowed to enter because of his views. So, yeah, not someone you want to bump into at the airport lounge. Probably not. So it's it's one thing to, you know, hear these sound bites and be like, whoa, this guy's intense. But to really understand, like, the, the why, we need to go deeper, right? right? We need to look at his theology. And we have this forum discussion, blunt Calvinists, and they're tackling this from, like, a very specific perspective. Can you give us a crash course in like Calvinism 101 and how Anderson's beliefs like do or don't line up? Sure. So Calvinism is this, it's a major branch of Protestant Christianity. Okay. And it's really interesting to compare them because on the one hand, they both share some some core Christian beliefs, yep. right? But then when you dig a little deeper, there are these massive differences in how they interpret things. Got it. Got it. So let's let's unpack that a little bit. Let's start with like salvation. What's the blunt Calvinists take on how Anderson views salvation? So Anderson, he, he's all about free will. OK. He believes that anyone can be saved if they simply choose to believe in Jesus. OK. Calvinists, on the other hand, they, they adhere to this doctrine called predestination. Predestination, right, right. Which basically means that God has already decided who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. And it's got nothing to do with anything you do. It's not about being a good person or... or Exactly. It's all God's plan. So Anderson's like, you choose. And Calvinists are saying, nope, God's already made up his mind. 
pretty much. That's that's a big difference. And that difference, it impacts everything. So like even the way they preach, the forum talks about this. Okay. Yeah. You know, Anderson is very intense in the pulpit, lots of fire and brimstone. Mm-hmm. He really emphasizes God's wrath, you know, the punishment side of things. Which to be fair, I vaguely remember from Sunday school, that's like a, a thing, right? Right. But even within that, there are nuances. Okay. Reform theology, Mm -hmm. you know, it acknowledges that God is just and that there are consequences for sin. Right. But there's also this huge emphasis on God's mercy, his grace, his love, which is something that a lot of people feel is missing from Anderson's message. So less love, more punishment. The forum actually quotes a verse from Ephesians. Oh. Ephesians 2.8 to 9. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. They're basically saying salvation is not something you earn. It's a gift. It's given freely by God. That's a really good point. So it's not even that they necessarily disagree on, you know, the existence of God's judgment. Right. It's more like, how do you frame it? It's the tone. It's the delivery. Yeah. It's like one is shouting about the storm and the other is like, hey, here's some shelter. It's, yeah, it's all about like, you know, how are you presenting this? And and this kind of gets into another point that the blunt Calvinists bring up, which is this whole King James only movement. Right, right. Because, I mean, Stephen Anderson, he is all about the King James version. Oh, yeah. He's he's on record saying that he thinks it's the only true English translation of the Bible. And the blunt Calvinists, brunt as they are, um, they're not so on board with that. No, not really. I mean, they get it. You know, the KGV has historical significance. It's it's important. But they're more focused on making sure that the Bible is understandable and accessible to everyone. So like using more modern translations. Exactly. Because language evolves. Right. Right. So what made sense, you know, hundreds of years ago might not be so clear today. Plus, there's been a lot of scholarship, a lot of discoveries of even older manuscripts. So it's about using the best, most accurate sources we have. So it's about like keeping the message true to the original text, but also making it relatable to people today. Exactly. Which is, I guess, a good segue into, you know, one of the biggest controversies surrounding Anderson, which is his stance on on homosexuality. Yeah, that's something the forum definitely does not shy away from. So like what's their issue there? Is it about how they interpret the verses themselves or is it something else? I'd say it's more nuanced than that. They they generally hold to a more traditional view on biblical sexuality, but um, their criticism is directed more at Anderson's approach. <laughs> like they think he's so focused on condemnation that he misses the whole point of grace and love, which, you know, you could argue is kind of the core of Christianity. So, like, even if they might agree on the quote unquote sin, it's more about how you talk about it. Right. Like, how do you communicate something that's difficult, that's yeah. challenging, you know? And and this actually, like, this difference in tone, it extends to their views on government, too, which Anderson has very strong opinions on. Yeah, he's he's not a fan of big government. To say the least. No, not at all. He's he's almost encouraging people to like rebel, you know, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to things like taxes or or government mandates, that kind of thing. And the forum, they're saying they're coming from a very different place. Like their view, it's more about respecting authority because they see it as something that's ordained by God. OK, so more like pray for your leaders, not fight the power. Yeah, exactly. But it's not like they're saying just blindly follow. You know, (laughs) right. They acknowledge that governments can be flawed, that leaders aren't perfect. So what happens when those leaders are like actively doing bad stuff? That's that's where it gets interesting. Right. They they do believe in civil disobedience. Mm. Like if there's a law that's truly unjust, you have a moral obligation to, you know, stand up against it. Mm. But they always, always start from this place of respect, of prayer. Interesting. It's like even if you completely disagree with someone, you still treat them with dignity. You still hope for the best. Okay, so we're seeing this pattern, right? On these core theological issues, Anderson's views are just, they're just clashing yeah. hard. But what's even more troubling is when you see this, like these disagreements play out in his actions. And I'm not just talking about, you know, what he says in his sermons, but also how he apparently treated his own family. Right. And this Arab news article, they call him a serial abuser of free speech which is a really serious accusation (laughs) what are they talking about there so we have to define hate speech like it's not just having an unpopular opinion it's not just saying something offensive hate speech is about inciting violence inciting discrimination against a specific group of people and unfortunately there are times when anderson's words 
they seem to cross that line. The article talks about his reactions to the Orlando shooting and the Paris attacks. What did he say that was so bad? So after the Pulse nightclub shooting, he actually said that the victims, because of their sexual orientation, deserve to die. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and you can't you can't just separate that. You can't detach that from the fact that this was a hate crime, you know, that targeted people based on their identity. Right. And then after the Paris attacks, he basically said that the people who were killed at the concert, that they brought it upon themselves. Wow. So instead of meeting these tragedies with any sort of like, you know, empathy, compassion, he's using them as a platform. As a platform to further his own agenda. Exactly. And that's that's really scary yeah. because he's not just expressing an opinion at that point. He's he's potentially putting people at risk Yeah, because words have power. Absolutely. And it's just it's such a stark contrast, right? Because you think of like religious leaders and there's this expectation of like love and compassion. Right. right yeah, yeah. And then you have this YouTube interview with his son, John, and it just paints a very different picture of of their family life. Yeah. And what's really sad about that is. You know, if you look at the church's website, if you read Susanna's blog, mm -hmm. they present this very specific image of their family. Right. Like the perfect Christian family. Right. And then John comes forward and it's like this wrecking ball. Yeah. He describes these brutal punishments. We're talking like beatings with electrical cords, being deprived of food, being locked outside in the Arizona heat. It's it's just I mean, how. How can anyone even do that to a child, especially their own child? It's it's awful. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, he talks about how they would actually keep track of these punishments, like like it was some kind of point system. It's like they were tallying up their cruelty. Yeah. And then he even says that his mom, like she was being abused, too, mm. by his dad. Mm. And it just makes you wonder, like, how can this happen? How can this happen in a family that's supposed to be like, you know, the epitome of of Christian values? It's like this whole idea of family values just gets twisted, you know? Yeah, and I think it points to this really uncomfortable truth about abuse, which is that it can happen anywhere. Right. doesn't matter how religious you are, how wealthy you are, how put together you seem on the outside. Mm -hmm. Behind closed doors, it could be a completely different story. And what's scary is how easily people can be fooled, yeah, right? right? Like, if someone is charismatic enough, if they can preach a good sermon, you just, you want to believe them. Especially when it comes to religion, right? Like mm -hmm. You're taught to trust your pastor, your priest, your rabbi. Right. They're supposed to be these moral guides. But John's story, it's a reminder that, that even those figures, they can be flawed. They're human. Yeah. And sometimes they're even dangerous. So where does that leave us? Like if you're, if you're someone who's sitting in the pews listening to this guy every week, what's your responsibility when you start to see these cracks? That is the question, isn't it? And it's not an easy one to answer. It's easy to get caught up in the message, in the community. It can be really hard to admit that someone you respect, someone you admire, might be capable of doing something wrong. Especially when it's someone you've put your faith in. Exactly. But I think John's story, it's a reminder that we can't just check our brains at the door. You know, we have a responsibility to think critically, to question things, even when it's hard. Even if it means questioning the people we look up to. Especially then. Because sometimes the most dangerous people are the ones who seem the most trustworthy. It's about trusting your gut, right? Like, if something feels off, it probably is. And it's about remembering that true faith, it shouldn't require you to ignore red flags. Or to stay silent when you see something wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Because silence, it just allows those harmful behaviors, those harmful beliefs to continue. So where do we go from here? What are we supposed to do with all of this? You know, I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I do think this deep dive, it's a reminder that faith is complicated. Leadership is complicated. Yeah, it's not always sunshine and roses. No, definitely not. Yep. And it's up to us, each of us, to be critical thinkers, to be compassionate, to speak up when we see injustice. Even when it's hard. Especially then. Well, on that note, that feels like a good place to, to wrap things up. Yeah. It's a lot to unpack, but um, I think the biggest takeaway here is that, you know, true faith it should empower you to do good, to do good, to stand up for what's right, to not be afraid to ask hard questions. Feel the pain.
strength. <laughs>